Welcome to Uppsala University and Uptalk Weekly. My name is Karin Tellenberg and I will be your host today, together with my colleague Lina Sors Emelsson. Uptalk Weekly is a popular science seminar and a part of the Faculty of Science and Technology Online Education Initiative for our alumni and society. One of the main goals with these seminars is to provide you as a participant the opportunity to interact with our researchers. So please ask questions at any point during the seminar. Ask your question through the chat function. And I would like to remind you to keep your camera and the microphone off during the entire seminar. And this seminar is being recorded. Our guest today is Valentin Troll. Valentin is a professor at the Department of Earth Science, National Resources and Sustainable Development. And during the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about the two phases of volcanoes learning to benefit from the monster. Warm welcome, Valentin. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, very nice to having you here. So let's start with the first question. Uh, as an ex why this large interest in volcanoes? Oh, well, uh, my personal interest in volcanoes goes back to my childhood. I remember this uh, vividly, sitting on my parents' couch um, on a Sunday afternoon, watching a movie about Krakatau, and I could barely sleep at night. So this uh, fascination hasn't really left me. And uh, I have been interested in volcanoes ever since, and uh, the interest has actually been growing. So I think volcanoes are beautiful things that are on the one side dangerous, but on the other side, very beneficial to us as humans and society. Yeah, I think so as well. And I think that the dangerous parts is kind of what people think about when it comes to the volcano. So let's start there. What is the dangerous part with volcanoes, both direct and indirect? Yes, there is, of course, um, uh, um, a, a large number of different uh, hazards uh, or risks that are involved when you live around volcanoes. And I prepared a little slide. Let me maybe share that with you. Yep. So uh, I'll get this up in a minute. So here is uh, various uh, possible risks that you're facing living close to a volcano, from uh, uh, lava uh, to uh, collapses to ashfall. But uh, we could also have pyroclastic flows and huge eruption clouds. So if you live close to a volcano, this can be very hazardous. But there's also indirect effects, and they are usually a bit further afield. There could be landslides, there could be tsunami, like we've seen very recently in Krakatau in Indonesia. And then, of course, there could be more distant effects. And ultimately, uh, volcanoes can even have an effect on climate. Usually after large eruptions, we have a bit of global cooling on a reasonably small scale, but it does affect. And if it comes together with other phenomena, this could be a disturbance to the world we know. Yeah. And if you're uh, as an expert on volcanoes and as a researcher who works with volcanoes, what is your main task, would you say? Well, there's two sides to this. On the one side, we have to learn to better understand volcanoes in order to get humans out of harm's way. We have no means of preventing volcanic eruptions, but we can learn how volcanoes operate. And uh, my analogy is often a bit like a high-speed train. Standing in front of a high-speed train is not a good place to be. But if you happen to be on the high-speed train, you might have a magnificent <laughs> journey. So it's about learning how to work volcanoes in our favor. Yeah, I totally understand. And uh, when it comes to volcanoes, it's just not the particular volcano and everything that goes around with it. But the society that li lives nearby a volcano uh, I understand how do you as a researcher work with them? Because if, uh, if there's been a, an eruption or you think that there will come an eruption, like, uh, yeah, what happens to the people living nearby a volcano? Yes, this is a very interesting question and there's a lot of factors to be considered. First of all, there's different types of volcanoes. Not every volcano is the same. We need to understand that. And then the society, uh, the people living around the volcano, they're in part dependent on the volcano. We need to understand their relationship as well. And there can be some cultural uh, 
uh, peculiarities in certain areas. And actually, I like to show you a little slide here, if you don't mind. So uh, I'll bring you back to my little slideshow here. And here is some impressions, one from Hawaii and one from Etna in Italy. And there you see uh, the volcano can impact on human society. And this has led um, to our <clears throat> um, technological efforts to understand volcanoes, to learn about them. And what I really wanted to show you is that the volcano has an impact on society. And like in Japan, like in Hawaii, volcanoes are often revered. And uh, this can lead to strange situations like um, in this particular case, uh, there in Indonesia, people revere the volcano so much that they actually lead processions up the volcano when it's erupting. And this can go horribly wrong at times. So we need to find ways to interact with society and uh, make them understand that volcanoes are not just heavenly creatures, that they can actually be really, really dangerous. And how do you do that? I think that some people or some cultures, they are not very, they, they don't listen to science because that's not their main goal for knowledge like they have this uh, gods or anything so how do you easily like when you know that there's coming an eruption so how do you inform them that they might have to kind of run away not going up to the volcano this is a very new research field that really has been uh, growing over the last 10 years and um, this is uh, trying to understand uh, culture and particularly old legends in uh, certain areas and uh, volcanologists try to work with that. And the particular example I was involved is in uh, central Java in Indonesia. There's legends about um, a devil that lives inside the volcano and it has uh, a very kind of um, intense relationship to a sea goddess that lives uh, some 40 kilometers away. And they visit each other. And um, when uh, they travel towards each other, then uh, usually this would be manifesting itself in earthquakes and potentially then when they come together in eruptions. And um, you might tell local people, oh, there's more earthquakes, but um, or the seismicity is increasing, but that will not really ring a bell for them. But if you point out that the queen of the South Sea is on the travel towards the devil inside the volcano, that rings a bell. And uh, this has now been tested in several schools around Merapi volcano, one of the most active ones in uh, central Java. And um, the uh, test results in terms of risk awareness in the schools have dramatically increased in those schools where this has been taught. So hopefully this will be taught now on a national level in Indonesia, but we will have to see. But work is in progress there. Yeah, and that sounds really nice because I understand that it's very hard for, for the society and the governments near the volcanoes just to get everyone to understand and be able to move away from the volcanoes. Uh, just another question, and I will just uh, inform all the participants that please ask questions in the chat function. You can just ask anything and we will bring them to Valentin. But is there a possibility to actually stop uh, volcano eruption or is it just as a researcher you only want to know can you can only know when it's going to erupt but not stop it or where's the research and technology there yeah. it's a very important question um, at this point I, uh, I am not aware that we have any means of stopping or preventing a volcanic eruption there has been successful cases where um, we have um, diverted lava flows like in Italy or where um, spraying water on it, uh, like in Iceland, 73 Heime, uh, has led to some successes there. It was possible to prevent uh, the filling of the harbor basin. But uh, oh, if the volcano is really strong, then uh, these methods will, will dwarf any human effort. So at this point, we have no means to okay. really stop volcanic eruptions. Um, NASA has recently discussed that maybe we want to drill inside volcanoes and to let the pressure out, but if the volcano is really close to a major eruption, then I look at it like a, a filled air balloon. You don't want to go there with a needle and poke in it. So um, from that point of view, I think what we need to realize is once the volcano is close to erupting, we have to get out of the way. It's like the high-speed train. You want to not stand in its way. And this is what we need to better understand. Yeah. 
And we have a question from Lasse here. Uh, mm. I can understand religious reason for staying and building close to volcanoes. But what about places like around Vesuvius? Why are people not afraid? That's actually a really good question. And I think we have to think a little bit about um, the frog in the warming water glass. So it's a, human, um, it's a human condition that when we feel comfortable, at least in our memory and maybe the memory of our parents in a certain area, then um, we will not be inclined to move away. Also, um, from um, Naples, as well as from many other places in the world, volcanic soil makes things very fertile. So agriculturally, it's a very attractive spot to live close to a volcano. And um, in Italy, for example, uh, well, we grow wine there and all sorts of kind of other goodies. So this is making the volcanic slopes actually highly attractive for economic reasons, as well as uh, the other more religious aspect to it. Uh, and that will bring us kind of into the more beneficial parts when it comes to volcanoes. And uh, now we talked a bit about the monster, but uh, as you've said, the people don't want, they want to live near, to, near volcanoes due to, yeah, the good, uh, yeah, the good soil and everything. Absolutely. So, yeah, so could you tell us a bit more about the, yeah, the beneficial parts? Absolutely. Again, I prepared a few slides. Let me just quickly show them to you, if that's okay. Yep. So uh, one aspect is that humans have been using volcanic material for building, and this is really going through history and through cultures from the Romans to uh, uh, Buddhist temples, uh, to even uh, more modern buildings like this little church here in the top right on Tenerife, it's all made of volcanic rock. And even the cement that the Romans used that still works today is made of volcanic material. We must also not forget that most of our metal resources come from volcanoes. Kiruna, for instance, was a giant volcano back in its day. We don't see that anymore today, but uh, the metal we get from there, the iron, comes from under a volcano. Not to mention diamonds, they're usually also coming from volcanoes. There's non-metallic resources, like here, for example, uh, sulfur. We can use it for disinfection, but also uh, it was traditionally used for gunpowder. If you think of Sweden's uh, Stormax Sedan, then, uh, well, there was a lot of sulfur in use and usually it, comes, it came from, from Iceland, actually. And um, then uh, a lot of things people don't quite know. Porcelain comes from feldspar, which is a mineral that is very frequent in volcanic rocks. We also must think of volcanic particles in toothpaste. The whitening in toothpaste is uh, usually done with little pumice flakes. And body scrub has little pumice as well. Stonewash jeans. All of these things are volcanic in nature, uh, or at least have touched volcano at some point. Then let me stress that 70% of coffee and tea, coffee is here on the left, tea on the right, comes from volcanic soils and volcanic slopes. And um, so does cocoa and chili beans and tomatoes and other fruits like this. The spice islands in Indonesia are volcanic in nature. And uh, here's tobacco. Tobacco is um, a plant that's increasingly used for medicinal purposes and it grows particularly well on volcanic soil. So also volcanic soil is very fertile and it can hold moisture better. So there's currently some research about uh, using volcanic particles to actually fertilize otherwise dry soil. So these are all kind of advantages and there's more. We can uh, use volcanoes for geothermal energy and uh, the upper picture here in the top right is from Iceland. And Iceland is uh, producing more bananas than any other country in Europe because of the geothermal energy, which is quite remarkable, I find. And uh, let's see, what else did I prepare? Yes, that's the climate things, but maybe we'll come to that in a minute. So I'll stop the sharing function now to get myself back in view. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it, as you can see, there's a lot of beneficial parts. And I just have a simple question, just out of curiosity. Have we had any volcanoes in Sweden? Um, there's no active volcanoes in Sweden, but uh, the last activity was about 180 million years ago in the Jurassic era. And there's reasonably fresh looking rocks in the south of Sweden, in Skane. They erupted back then. But the issue is uh, maybe not... Um, so much about whether we have volcanoes here. I think uh, a more important question is, can Sweden be affected by volcanoes? 
Yeah. And um, as you probably remember, in 2010, the Eyjafjallajökull eruption was a real bummer. Certainly for Northern Europe, uh, air travel was suspended. There was even uh, sulfurous fog in certain parts of Sweden. So um, these are phenomena that will hit home, even though we have no volcano here in the country. Yeah. So let's go back to the slide or to the topic that you just showed us quickly. Uh, how can volcanoes work like, uh, you mentioned the geothermal energy, but other mm -hmm. parts, uh, how can volcano works as an alternative energy source or more, how can they kind of contribute to different kind of uh, energy sources that are not fossil? Mm -hmm. This is very, very important. And I think, uh, again, I'll try to share my slides with you for a second. Um, we just had this one. And uh, this is a slide I prepared for you. So um, we will have huge demand for certain metals and uh, certain elements in the future. If we think of electrifying the traffic, we will need batteries and batteries depend on lithium right now. Maybe in a while we will have better technology, but at the moment lithium is crucial. And lithium comes either from rocks that we break in a quarry or from Solars. And here's a picture from Northern Chile. This is a salt lake and the white incrustations there that contains a lot of lithium. And that is what we need to mine in the future in order to actually make enough batteries to electrify our traffic. Then when we think of uh, green technologies here in the top left, I'm showing some solar panels and, um, and wind turbines. Uh, they rely heavily on rare earth elements and they often come also from volcanic rock. And um, there is um, a, a, an unequal and on uh, equal distribution of these elements over the globe and certain countries have more, others have less. And uh, Europe doesn't have too much of it. And uh, we need to think very carefully where we get them from. If yeah. we want to have um, uh, solar panels and even IT technology as we all enjoy these days, then um, we will have to think about retrieving it largely from volcanic rock in the future. So there will be huge demand for this. And uh, this of course causes some issues when we think of uh, the environment, but we have to make decisions. It's uh, a question of, uh, do we want to favor this or that? So like with almost everything in volcanoes, there's two sides to it. Yeah, of course. Uh, we have uh, two questions here. First, we have from Liana. Uh, Tol Pagoni in the Kemnekaise, uh, is, isn't, uh, isn't that an old volcano? To my understanding, and I've never been there, but to my understanding, it's actually not a volcano. It looks like a volcano. And uh, it's uh, a stone that erodes very tough. Uh, it's very hard for wind and weather to break it down. And so it forms a pointy end, but I don't think it's actually a volcano, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Yeah. <laughs> we have to check it out. Yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> and then we have a question from Bridget. Does Australia have a lot of these rare earth metals? Yes, there is uh, a lot of mineral wealth in Australia and um, there is uh, actually uh, a lot of diamonds uh, that come from Australia, but also a lot of uh, weathered volcanic rock that can be mined and they can have a lot of rare earth elements. Often what happens is that the volcanic rock weathers, some of the other components are stripped away by wind and rain and it leaves behind residual deposits and Australia is very good for that. So it's not the only country, but uh, the biggest, the most important reserves for rare earth elements is actually in China. And uh, that then requires some good trading with our Chinese friends in order to get access to them. Yeah, so everything is political. That uh, goes into the equation. Yes, yes. So, uh, and I've read an article that you have written, I'm not remembering the, the actual newspaper, and we don't have to mention that as well, but uh, you, written about these super volcanoes. Oh, yes, what is absolutely. a super volcano and uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that since I understand that they've had something to do with uh, human evolution? Yes, that's a very interesting aspect. This is a much wider aspect and um, super volcanoes are really large volcanoes. We have a limited number of them but uh, the last super volcano and the only one that erupted during Homo sapiens time on Earth is the Toba volcano uh, in Sumatra in Indonesia. It erupted 73,000 years ago 
And uh, humans, Homo sapiens, is around on this planet for about 200,000 years. We, uh, according to the archaeological record, did quite okay, but nothing spectacular happened in the first 100,000 years of our existence. But after Toba erupted, uh, things got very complicated. Um, the climate changed as a result, and it got rather unpleasantly cold for quite some time. People estimate up to a thousand years. This is the time when the first humans really pushed outside Africa, and this is also when um, certain features came up. For instance, head lice, the little creatures that you might find in your, on, on, on your scalp, they are much, much older than uh, humans, but uh, body lice, the ones that live in our clothes, they're about 70,000 years old. And it's believed that we started to wear clothes after the Toba eruption because things got very desperate and very cold. And this is evidenced by the evolution of certain parasites that have then started to live in the clothes that we have been manufacturing. So the way we operate has been dramatically influenced by volcanoes, not just the way we are migrating, but also the way we dress. And once we dress, we have fashion and culture and all that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, very interesting. And now we go back to the, the, the rare metals because we have a question here from Lasse. Could Iceland be a potential export country for rare metals being in principle just a huge volcano? Unfortunately, the uh, type of rock that erupts on Iceland predominantly is not the best source of these metals. But Iceland has a few other advantages. Um, Iceland at the moment experiences quite a lot of glacial melting. And uh, that means a lot of water runs off the glaciers and the Icelanders have started to put hydro plants there. So they can harvest the energy from the glacial melting. And this allows them to have really cheap energy. So this energy is likely being exported in the future to the UK and other places. So Iceland will, as a volcanic situation in the polar or close to the polar region be a very useful energy resource but rare earth elements i think we might need to look in other places for getting higher concentrations at least at this point in time okay. and then we have another question here from uh Ren Kai Peng. i'm sorry if i'm not uh, spelling your name out right but does we need do we need more metals means we need more volcano eruption in the future <clears throat> hopefully not. Uh, we don't need the volcanoes to erupt. Uh, hopefully we can harvest uh, eruptive products from the past. And uh, currently I'm working on a little very interesting project. We have some submarine samples from um, the flanks of some of the Canary Islands. And it turns out that some of the rocks there, they're a little more enriched than normal volcanic rock in these rare elements. So maybe we can actually start to do some submarine mining and that would be rocks that have erupted quite a while ago. So they wouldn't have to be fresh eruptive materials. But if the right rock erupts, I guess we could take that as well. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have a question from Thomas. How about underwater volcanoes? Are there many eruptions going on constantly, but that they are not as visible as land volcano eruptions? This is a very good point and absolutely correct. About 84% of volcanoes are actually underwater. So uh, there is um, something like, um, well, there is eruptions every day underwater. We just don't see them. They're rather harmless because the lava type uh, that is erupting there is um, a high viscosity. It flows rather calmly and there's a lot of water pressure. So we don't necessarily, <coughs> excuse me, see that at the surface, but this is a huge um, um, fracture zone that spans almost the entire globe. And uh, along these fracture zones in the oceans, we have volcanic eruptions very frequently. Initially, it was detected when um, we tried to put cables to America to actually have telegraph conversations with America. And the cables always broke in a certain place. And people then realized, oh my God, something is going on. And once we had U-boats and submersibles, we realized what's going on. There's a mountain chain under the oceans and it's made of volcanoes. Okay, but how do, do they affect us in any way? Like all these eruptions, do we kind of see them or are they kind of necessary for us that they erupt? They are useful for a lot of things. They bring uh, nutrients to the seawater. Actually, the seawater is exchanging with these rocks. And if we think about potential deep sea mining in the distant future, right on the crests of these volcanoes, we get a lot of sulfites. 
So sulfites, they bring a lot of copper, for example, but also uh, some other elements that are useful for us, manganese, etc. And uh, these are targets for submarine mining. The way it's currently pictured is not necessarily that we go down there as humans, but this is mainly done by robots and uh, machinery that we can operate remotely in a few hundred years, potentially. But if the world population is growing the way it is, and we want to ensure that everybody has the same standard of living, we might need to fall back on these reserves below the oceans. That is something that is very close. Otherwise, we would have to go to other planets, which is a lot more trouble, I think. Yeah, and when it comes to saving our own planet, we are now talking a lot about this uh, heating that the, the temperature on Earth is getting warmer and warmer. And as you just slowly showed us a slide about can volcanoes help us? Because as you mentioned in the beginning, it, it can have a cooling uh, effect on the climate uh, years ago. But how is this? Uh, does researchers kind of look into this right now? How they, if, if a volcano eruption can actually cool and, and be, be kind of good for us in that kind of way. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of these delicate things. I mean, let me quickly go get this slide up. I, I, I like it so much, so I thought um, it's worth sharing. Um, we have two minutes here. left, so you have to kind of yes, I'll just... Be very quick here. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, some people think that because volcanoes can cool the climate a little bit, that maybe triggering volcanic eruptions might be a good thing. And... Um, well, the reality is they will cool for a few years, but ultimately they also produce a lot of CO2 and other um, uh, gases that are then in the atmosphere and they will in the long run cause some warming. We would be quite dependent on triggering a lot of volcanoes very quickly in order to keep it cool if we want to go this route. Not strictly advisable right no. now. No, maybe the, the best thing is to learn how to monitor and see how they are uh, and perhaps if they're not going to erupt just to, to keep us alive, the whole society. But now we're having just a few, two minutes or one minute left. And what is the thing that you want to, to kind of summarize all the things that we talked about? Uh, if you want, just want to give one message to the audience when it comes to volcanoes. Yes, my be? personal message is that um, while a lot of people are quite intimidated by volcanoes, like I was as a boy, of course, uh, I like to also stress that volcanoes are really, really useful. They're an enormous source of uh, resources for us, for our society. We almost, we, we touch volcanoes every day in some form or another. And I think uh, volcanoes, because of the risks associated, have a somewhat bad reputation. They have nevertheless done a lot of good for our society and we wouldn't be the same as we are today without volcanoes on this planet. So I think Volcanoes are partly our friend, and uh, I want to close with my little goodbye slide. Let me get this up here. I think we really owe volcanoes a big thank you. Yeah, and we also want to thank you, Valentin, for taking time to come here and talk to us about uh, volcanoes. It's been very, very interesting, uh, at least for me and I hope for everyone else. And uh, I just want to thank you, and I want to thank all my colleagues at Uppsala University, especially Lina Soros Emelson, who is uh, doing this together with me. We joined uh, moderating this Up Talk Weekly. And I also want to thank all my colleagues from the Communication and Outreach Office and Professor Mikael Johansson from Uptech. And next Tuesday, Lina will host this seminar and our guest is Albert Miranian, professor at the Department of Material Science and Engineering. And he will talk about save life by sifting out viruses as easily as you brew coffee, development of nanotechnical paper filters for drinking water purification. So warm welcome and till next week, have a nice Tuesday. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, thank you.